in your book, um, you say the phrase um, tiny penis syndrome in disguise. What is that? When I was writing chapter titles, that came about, but it was a really fun time reading these kinds of things aloud when I was doing the audiobook in front of a bunch of male engineers. <laughs> Going for it. I'm just like, yeah, which one is it? Which one is it? Is it you? It, maybe it's you. <laughs> Who's got the tiny penis? Hey, Warners, welcome to Women Your Mother Warned You About. The podcast that makes business sexy again. I'm Rachel Pitts, mommy, wifey, and mortgage loan officer at U.S. Mortgage. Oh, the singing lender. I'm going to be the singing improviser. <laughs> and I'm Gina Tremarco, founder and sales trainer at Pivot 10 Results and Carolina Improv Company. Hey. Hey, hey, hey. What's loving, up? loving Ash. Um... I have been reading her book, and I, I posted on her Instagram yesterday, uh, she had a post about her book upcoming, and I forgot that it's not really been released at the time of oh, you know, the right. podcast. We have our special, fancy, special. fancy advanced copies. So I said, um, <laughs> I said, I love, I'm loving reading your book. I'm so, I'm annoyed that sometimes I have to stop reading it to like do work and shit. Ugh, so annoying. Just want to sit here and read it. <laughs> well, I still I have to find out what happened with the mailbox because I haven't gotten mine. So maybe it's lost or maybe I'll just borrow yours. You can have mine when I'm done. I'm trying to read okay. at least a chapter a day of it. So it's really ex most excellent, y'all. You know, I um when Doug first told us about her coming on our show, I was like, oh, my, another business crush, a girl business crush, because I have been following Ash for years. And I think what got my attention was the Middle Finger Project which is her website, the middle fing middlefingerproject.org. So I took one of her courses uh, a couple years ago on your voice and branding or copywriting. Or, anyway, she's freaking brilliant. So Ash Amberger is our guest on this episode. She's author of the book, The Middle Finger Project, Trash Your Imposter Syndrome and Live the Unfuckwithable Life You Deserve. That's a hard word to say. Unf unfuckwithable. I did it good though. You did. You did, you did better than I thought I would do if I had to do that line. Well, you know what? One quick question before we get into her um, her bio. So she's got this amazing energy, you guys, that you're <gasps> just gonna die. So I'm just wondering if she has that much amazing energy because she has reached a level of success and created this life that she loves, or if because she became more of herself and has this energy mm. that it led her to reach this level of success and have the life that she loves. Ooh, that is a really philosophical comment. That's a th really philosophical, Rach. I haven't had a we lot should... of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, she said she'd come back to the show and she was so excited to be on the show and she loves the show and that's exciting. Well, we'll have to send her this little clip and, and let her answer that because I just I was just thinking about it while I was reading her her book. And I think it's probably the latter that she just has this crazy energy and some of the creative ways that she connected with her clients to get her yeah. to the next level, if you will, in her um in her corporate business life. And then she just kind of got sick of it. Um, but uh, she's got great energy. Just saying. Yeah, I think, um, I think at our core, we all, we are who we are at our core, right? Like I noticed that there are some days that I wake up most days, actually, um, I wake up super joyful and I've noticed this puppy energy. I have this, what I call it puppy energy. Like I'm like, puppy puppy I'm like happy 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 puppy 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 and I'm like where is this coming from but I think it was always at the core right so I think we you have that part that's your core um then you go through shit in your life in and out and some days you're at your core and some days you're not but it's like deep down inside I think so I'm, I'm guessing that's she probably just heightened what she already was because she's got an interesting background she after growing up in rural Pennsylvania, in a rural Pennsylvania, you say that again, rural. In a rural, like in the country, in the country in Pennsylvania, tra in a trailer park, 
Um, she had a string of dead end, a dead end jobs, and she lost both parents at the age of 21. Uh, she was living without a safety net and sleeping in a Kmart parking lot. When she faced her truth, no one was coming to rescue her. I think most of us have had those moments, so, you know, especially when we get in the victim mindset of like, somebody come save me. Yeah, I, think kinda... I remember one time posting something on Facebook because I read it in another book that was like, no one is coming to save you. And then, of course, you have some super Christians that are like, oh, but your savior is there for that. I'm like, oh, it's not what I mean. Oh my gosh, stop it. <laughs> oh, no, we're going to get letters from the super Christians. And don't get us wrong. We are Christian girls. But see, even still, we- you still, even if the savior is going to save you, you have to be willing yourself to save yourself. E- yep. So anyway, I got Amen, a- a- amen to that. <laughs> um as a result um, of uh, waiting to be rescued and realizing she wasn't going to be, she went from being a listless 20-something who could hardly afford to stick a deodorant, that's scary, especially if you're living in your car, to insuring her first million dollars from the backseat of her car, which we ask her about because I want to make money in the backseat of my car, <laughs> but you know what I mean, like not in the <laughs> wrong way. <laughs> Let me say that again. <laughs> I don't know if there's a good way to say that. I want to make money. The you, my car. I think the way you said it is perfect. Okay. So, um, she, anyway, she was making money in the backseat of her car all by trusting her own ideas, showing up to lead without being asked, and following a career method she now calls radical self reliance which we also talked about. So I thought that was really cool. I love the word reliance. Yes. And just to be clear, I'm pretty sure that Ash was making her first million from the backseat of her car using a laptop. (laughs) She's interacting with a laptop and the internet. Although she did point out that there's not an internet connection in the Kmart parking lot. So, you know, you'll have to listen through the the episode to hear what she does. Yeah, that's um, yeah, that's scary, and and we have to give a fair warning. Her energy is over the top. Like we thought we had energy, but her energy is like, poo. I know. I felt like I was super mellow, but I know Doug was like, raise your energy. He was sending us messages. Raise your energy. <laughs> <laughs> but she's um she's really energetic so everybody sit back for this ride um with this episode featuring ash amberger My God, it's going to be the loudest episode you ever had. <laughs> oh my God. Good morning. Good morning. I mean, you see the size of my coffee cup, right? Like, it- <laughs> hey, size is not the most important thing. Always, clearly, the quality of what's inside. I is, mean, is, is killing it. I like size and quality. I want both. <laughs> Why settle? I mean, there might there, there might just be like a whole bunch of vodka in here. What do we know? <laughs> Quick plug on my flower necklace. A, a good friend of mine makes these. Her name is Stacy Witten Summers, and she, um, I don't know what her website is. I better find it so we can put it in the show notes. She makes these little flowers by hand, and I just love them. Cute. They're so cool. I absolutely love it. I'm, I'm a huge, like, jewelry kind of person. Earrings, necklace, rings, whatever. Dainty stuff does not, it doesn't go with me. We're going to, maybe you need to make, like, a get a, get a flower necklace just for Ash. I can totally. What color like do you custom. want, Ash? Well, well, I hate the color pink. Like I hate it with a passion. But now it's the color of my book, so I feel like I, I need to like buy like a pink blazer. I should probably do something no. like magenta. I have to now. So what made you? What made you choose the pink for the cover, or did someone else choose it? No, girl. Yeah, no, that was not me. <laughs> We, I mean, at the end, it was me. They gave me the choice, but they were like, listen, we really think this is the best way to go. And I pushed back so hard at first. I was like, there it is. And I just got the real one in the mail oh, I yesterday. Love that it says uncorrected proof for limited distribution. I was super stoked Ooh. about that. I'm like, oh, there's probably errors in it, which is even more special. I'm original before you become like a superstar international. <laughs> really, 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 really rock. I got to tell you, Ash, um, when Doug told us about that he got you, I was like, you have no idea. I'm like, I, I love her. 
I have girl crush. I love you. I like I've I have contributed to her millions of dollars by buying her stuff. <laughs> yes. Listen, out of all the podcasts I've been on, like I was really excited to come here because I listened to your stuff and I'm like, oh yeah, this is gonna be fun. <laughs> That's not, what did you listen to? Which ones? Uh, I've listened to a bunch of them. The last one I heard was about following your voice or not caring about what the naysayers say, but I can't remember who did oh, it. Oh, like standing in your standing in your kind of standing in your brand, standing in your voice. Yeah, I don't know. It was a couple of days ago. You're like requesting a lot of my memory. They're, right awesome. <laughs> They're all They're awesome. They're all They're all really awesome. I was just wondering if if you listen to the one about bee penises. So that's that's um <laughs> no, about but I will for that. Now. about bee sex. Yes, it's about bee That's sex. my contribution. You're I can't welcome. Wait. <laughs> hey, let's let's because <laughs> Gina will go into a long tangent of love fest if I let her because she loves to love yes, on people. Yes, because I love okay, her. Okay, so we got that established. But moving okay. on, let's because there's a lot of, of of meat to cover, if you will, with Ash. So let's rewind back to the, the very beginning and talk about your story because you have an incredible story. You you didn't grow up the wealthy, amazing person that some may think. So tell, tell us what your story was and just go from there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it all started back in a trailer park in rural Pennsylvania, as all good stories do. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people can relate to that. Like, not a lot of money growing up. It was me and my mom who had this severe social anxiety, and, and she, like, didn't leave the house. And so I always was trying to figure out as a young person, really what it looked like to do work that you were proud of, because I never saw that. I mean, my mom never modeled that for me at all. We were absolutely um, like on food stamps and government assistance. And she had, she had like a mortgage that she held that she was gifted basically. But other than that, it was, it was slim. So I, um, I grew up wanting, wanting to know about the world and she actually passed away before I was 21. So there I am in this trailer park. Here's me going, well, what the fuck am I supposed to do now? I took off for the city of Philadelphia Woo. because I, I was like, yeah, all right. That seems like the kind of place where people probably eat lemon pepper chicken and things like poppy seed bagels, which for me was like, <laughs> the ultimate. (laughs) And I went there to really just discover what does it mean to live a good life and do this work that you're proud of. I studied people like a creep. I was there every day in Philadelphia, just kind of like an anthropologist looking around to see what it was to be normal. And it essentially started the middle class project far before I started the name of my company now, which is the Middle Finger Project. And really, like, I remember discovering all of these things like, uh, you know, coach is not somebody's gym teacher and people actually pay money for the color nude on their fingernails. It was blowing my mind, all these things. <laughs> yes. And farmer's markets. Oh, my God. <laughs> they're big. <laughs> and so I learned and I mimicked and I tried to figure it out. And along the way, I discovered a lot of stuff that I was, I was very surprised to discover, including the fact that normal was the most disappointing thing that had ever happened to me. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could go on. I mean, we could just keep going, but that's really how it started. So how did you transition? Um, we'll talk a little more about your entrepreneurial story. How did you transition? Because you you came up with an idea while sleeping in the back of your car that makes a million dollars. <laughs> what was that about? And share oh, with us how to do that. I tell you what. Thank God for ideas. That sounds like uh, camping. <laughs> that sounds like camping. Gina, you know I don't do camping. <laughs> so you just move on to the business part. Okay, sorry. Just... <laughs> I don't do Mm-mm. camping either. I really, I don't understand bugs. Amen. I can't. Okay, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Um, I found one in my coffee maker this morning. I was What pissed. is that? I had one in my coffee maker. Anyways, we digress. I, I'm like, how did you even anyway, get there? Anyway, yeah, I, I know, I know. We're like, we're all like, we're, we're all squirrel chasers. So I'm, <laughs> Doug might have to jump in and No, I'm, we got it. We got it. In. So entrepreneur, entrepreneur, <laughs> show, like. entrepreneur. So back to the back seat, <laughs> back to the back seat of your car. Yes. So I I started the middle class project. I was very successful at that. I ended up making my first $32,000 a year, everybody. And then I went to $50,000. 
And like, I could go to Target and buy anything I wanted in the store. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and it was still just so, just radically disappointing. So at the time, I had read a book by NPR correspondent Eric Weiner called The Geography of Bliss. And in the book, he really was on this mission to go and search for what makes different cultures happy and different people in different contexts. And I started thinking more and more about that. And I realized, you know, geez, if human beings have developed hundreds of ways to communicate with one another, he's probably right. We've developed hundreds of ways to be happy in this fucked up world. And so I literally started doing like this thing where I was, I was going salsa dancing and I was going to all these different ethnic restaurants in Philadelphia, trying very hard to figure it out. I ended up dating a very dangerous man who made $10 an hour, was pleased with that. He didn't have any higher aspirations for himself. And I know that sounds crazy, but at the time it was refreshing to me. It was refreshing for the first time in my life to think about what it was like to maybe not have to work so hard to get ahead. And maybe that's where happiness came from. Just gratitude and being content with yourself. Joy. Right? Like, joy. Lily, um. <laughs> <laughs> and I made some drastic decisions. I, I really spent some money I shouldn't have had. I, I definitely racked up my credit card debt because at that point I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to be a freelance writer and it's not going to matter if I make hundreds of thousands of dollars because this is the simple life. I did some drastic things, quit my job and sooner or later discovered this guy was an absolute like I mean, he was a, he, he was a, uh, I don't know, you know what the nice word for common disaster, is. Disaster. I'll just go for the real word. Uh, disaster Fuckwad. is a good word. <clears throat> yes. I, I found in his drawer uh, a, a number of like different IDs, Ooh. like ID. Yeah. Like all with his name on them. And I mean, all with his face on but them different and names. all sorts of names. And it was the scariest thing because now I put myself in this position to depend on him. I was in between jobs trying to be a freelance writer. I didn't have anywhere to go. And when I discovered this, things got a little violent and it was a very bad night. So I had to make this very hard decision. I thought, you know what? I have more integrity going to sleep in a Kmart parking lot tonight than I do staying here. So that's the moment when you have to figure it out. We've all had like rock bottom moments. It's probably not the same one, but we've all been yeah. there where we're like, oh shit, you know, what do we do next? You might not have parents to go home yep. to. You might not have a savings or you know some jewels you can pawn or like anything like that. I couldn't, I couldn't even bring my car back to the dealership because they wanted me to pay them $2,000 to take it off my hands. <laughs> And so in that parking lot, it was just this moment of, I am really screwed. I don't know where, what's going to happen. Are the police going to come? Are they going to arrest me for loitering? Are they going to take me downtown? I mean, is some guy going to come along and like break my glass with a crowbar? I had no idea. So I started thinking about what it meant. What do people do when they're in a bind? They sell something. So what do you sell when you don't have anything to sell? And that was the moment when... The DJ came on, the, the radio DJ in Philadelphia, and he was like, hey, everybody, Rihanna is coming out with a new album. It's available for pre-order. And as soon as he said that, I was like, hot damn. Oh, my God. Art is worth paying for, and you don't necessarily have to have that art finished in order to exchange it for future value. And it just hit me like, oh my God, I don't have anything to sell, but I do have my ideas and I do have creativity. And that was the moment when I had my little journal back there because I mean, this was like way before you had Wi-Fi on your phone and stuff. Like I definitely didn't have any internet connection. Took my little journal. I started writing things down. In the morning, I went to an internet cafe after I tried to go to the bank to get my, <laughs> to get my credit extended, which they denied. Um, <clears throat> I went Been to an internet that. cafe. <laughs> <laughs> it's really embarrassing. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I tried to take a payday loan and they were like, you don't have a job. So, <laughs> oh, it's the worst. It's the worst. <laughs> so, no, <laughs> you know, it's bad when, uh, yes. And so I went to an internet cafe and I, I made an offer to the world. I, you know, I had social media at that time. 
had a very small email list of people. I had started to write a little bit since being a freelance writer was my ultimate goal. And wouldn't you know, I put out a couple of different offers to the world. The first was, hey, you know what? I'm going to write a book. I am going to write a book. I had no business writing a book. I really did not. But I was like, I'm going to synthesize all the things we've been talking about here on the blog. I'm going to write a book. If you would like to pre-order it, here's the link. And then secondarily, I followed that up with, and also I've been getting a lot of requests from people who seem to really like the voice on the blog. So would you like me to write for you? And it was as simple as making those offers. And within 24 hours, I made my first $2,000, which at the time was like, oh my God. Like I pretty much had like the Egyptian pyramids like appear before me. And, and I never turned back. Okay, ever since. just a little digression, if that's a word, I'm not sure. Gina, I think you need stop. to create. A, D- I know. A- stop. Ash, I'd like you to join me Fuck. in Damn the you. fact that Fuck. Gina Tremarco has an incredible story and an incredible book in her that she continues to not finish. So I think that you and I should band together and force her to create a link similar to the one you did saying, hey, let's pre-order the book. Gina, I'll pre-order your fucking book, even though I know I'd get a free one. Just say it. I'll pre-order your fucking it's book. It's going to be a good book. Uh, absolutely. She's got a good, some good stories that I've heard her tell over and over and over and over and over. Anyways, back to <laughs> Ash. You know what? It's that accountability piece. Yes. Maybe, do Ash, it, maybe Ash could give me a little coaching you, on it. I promise you, Gina, that I just, our I, listeners we, we got want you. it. I know. They're, they're, they keep asking for it. Duh. I don't know what well, it I is. Well, I want it now, and I'm like, what? What? Tell me. There's I need so to know many the things. Me. I Ash, just don't know which one to write just, first. There's mobsters mm, and yeah, craziness bitch, and um, con artists involved, and it's amazing. So back to Ash. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that mobsters were involved in your in your bio, Gina, so I feel like this is a theme. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Mob. Did you see The Irishman? Because that's what I'm picturing right now. Um, and I started it. I haven't finished it yet, but I, I'm, I'm, it's on my like next thing to watch. Yeah, it's very, I mean, I, I kind of grew up that way. I mean, with the mobster yeah. dad. Love it. Inter- Love it. Okay. So, all right. The book, so, Ash's okay, book. Challenge Ash's Throne. Book. Thanks. Yeah. Let's talk about Ash's Yes, book. you're welcome. No so who who exactly is your book for Ash? Like what? Who is the person? Obviously, when I read the first chapter, I was like, "Oh fuck yeah, she's a woman." Your woman mother warned you about this book is for me. I should quit everything <laughs> and do the. But <laughs> I love the name of this podcast. By the way, it is so good. Yeah, the book is for the book is for women who really just need to believe in themselves a little bit more, who want to trust themselves, who really want to do something different, but they don't know what. That seems to be the common theme with all of my readers. It's like, I really fucking hate my job. I know I deserve more than this. I want to do something better. I just don't know what yet. And that's what we talk about a lot. And then it becomes, once you figure it out, how do you take that idea, that talent, that skill, and how do you make a shit ton of money with it? Because then you can do whatever you want to do. I don't care if it's being a great mom. I don't care if it's traveling the world. Whatever you want to do, I'm really good at making money these days. I figured a couple things out along the way. I like it. Hey, Warners, this is Gina Tremarco. And if you know Rachel and I, you know how much we love our beauty strategies, especially Dermavogue, where we both go to keep our faces looking younger and healthier. Every time someone says to me, something looks different about your face, I can't help but to tell them that the Dermavogue team, led by Dr. James Turk, has been offering the Greater Myrtle Beach area the best in cosmetic and aesthetic dermatology since 2003. Dermavogue combines expert medical knowledge with cutting-edge technology, bringing their patients the most effective, flawless solutions to any skincare or cosmetic need. Some of the services to consider include Botox, skin peels, facials, bio tea, and much more. I personally love and highly recommend their Botox and lip injections for making my face look younger and healthier, and for bio tea for improving my energy, sleep, and weight control. At Dermavogue, they gauge you in the process of total body health to ensure your satisfaction with their comprehensive selection of the most up-to-date, non-invasive cosmetic dermatology and spa treatments. If you want to look and feel your best, Dermavogue can help you get there. Schedule your consultation today by calling 843-357-2444 or visit Dermavogue.com and tell them that the women your mother warned you about sent you. So um, there's a phrase you use in your book, radical self-reliance. 
talk to us about that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, coming from this small podunk town, I still go back and visit at least once a year, almost, almost just to humble myself and remember where I came from. And I really appreciate doing that because some of the perspectives I hear from people every day who are not in this internet world, who aren't like, you know, in this thing where it's just so obvious to start a business or just obvious to start your own podcast. And a lot of the conversations that I have with people are around how difficult it is to get a job no one's hiring and there aren't any opportunities and slim pickings and they got to drive an hour one way just to get to the nearest metro area, which is like Binghamton, New York um, or Scranton. So I have a lot of conversations that are like that. And a lot of the focus of my work is helping people understand that the internet is not just for communicating anymore. You can use it to create you can create your own job, mama. I don't care where you are. I've lived in Costa Rica in the jungles for the last seven years growing my business. So I think that I'm pretty good proof coming from that trailer park in the middle of nowhere and still making it happen and living all over the place in these weird places. So for me, that's what radical self-reliance is. I don't want to ever have to depend on someone else's opinion of me for my livelihood and whether or not they give me the job or whether or not I get to keep my job. Well, let's let's dial back a little bit into your entrepreneur journey. Uh, you 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 started by pre-selling the book. You got that idea in the back seat, and you get the you get the book going. What happened next? Because I'm like so curious of of what that journey looked like. It was it was bananas. It was almost like the minute I gave myself permission to sell my own talents, it just like it it took off within. So that was in November of 2009. And by the following year, I hit my first $103,000. So it really was like a year span. And it, I mean, I never expected it to, but what I discovered was people don't necessarily know what you can do for them unless you tell them. And so much of making money is just standing up and being like, Hey, Here's what I can help you do. I'm really good at this one thing. Do you want my help? It is such a simple thing. And that's what I kept doing over and over every single week. I had something else I was working up on my sleeve to be like, hey, you know, I'm really good at this thing. Can I help you with it? Do you need help with this? I would be happy to do it for you. Here's how much it costs. And making it very simple. I talk about something called the hot dog theory of money, which I love because hot dogs are hilarious. (laughs) <laughs> and because they simplify, they simplify the act of making money a little bit. So much of us get mind fucked with this idea of like, are we good enough? I don't know how much to charge. And when you get on the phone with a client, you're like all anxious and you start automatically discounting your stuff before they've even said anything. Oh God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I mean, we all do it. It's so hard. When I used to sell advertising sales, I was selling a product, but now I'm selling myself and there's just a whole other level of self-esteem that comes with that, that you need to, you know, generate. So with the hot dog theory of money, I'm always like, okay, listen, if you were selling hot dogs on the Jersey shore straight up (laughs) and the customer came to you and they're like, Hey, I want to buy a hot dog. How much is it? You're just going to be like, yeah, it's a buck 75. Here you go. It's going to be a simple interaction. And you're not going to negotiate the price. You're not going to hem and haul. You're not going to try to like be like, well, but for you guys. Because you're struggling. You know, I can I- see that you're struggling <laughs> and I don't want to break your bank. <laughs> well, you know, that that, yes! that that really actually reminds me. You want to talk stories that Rachel likes to hear. That reminds me of the toaster story. Bring it. My, with my dad. Like my dad made us work in flea markets on the weekends. And so we had to learn how to sell things at like age 10. And so this guy comes to buy, my my dad sold everything from like toasters to porno movies to members only jackets, like seriously. So guy wants to buy a toaster, like it's a used toaster. And he's like, how much is it? My dad's like, it's $5. And the guy's like, I'll give you four. And my dad's like, it's five. He's like, I'll, you know, he started at three and then he went to four. And my dad kept saying it's five. And the guy like got mad and he left. And I was like mortified as a child. I'm like, what the, just sell him the fucking toaster. The guy comes back 15 minutes later. He's like, all right, uh, I'll give you five. My dad's like, it's 10. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. 
amazing. I love your father. <laughs> that was my that was my first lesson in selling. Was that? That is just genius. It and it's always the clients. Not to get off topic. It is always the clients who want to haggle that end up being the worst the clients worst. you've ever had. The woo! worst. Yeah. Amen. Woo! Like yeah. So much of it, it's like pricing is just like this little declarative statement and it doesn't need to be a conversation. It just is. It's a beautiful little declarative statement. It hopefully encapsulates everything the products is worth, including product, uh, profit. So many women are not building profit in, but um, unless you're you know, considering starting the next Make-A-Wish Foundation, you need to put that as a line item. It's a thing. And so the price of the hot dog is the price of a hot dog for a reason. And so are you. And it's just, that's it. That's what it is. And the, the better you get, the more expensive you are. Well, yeah. And sometimes people really want that. I mean, they, they want to feel like they're going to get something great for them. Well, I'm sure you've been through this. There've been times where like I've played with pricing where I, I was closing more deals with a higher price than a lower price. Yes. Perceived value. Yes. Perceived value. I was just on the phone with a woman two days ago who is just, she's a doctor. She's hot shit. She's got like this beautiful website. It is awesome. Her programs are real sexy. And she's like, but my funnel's not converting and I don't know what to do. So we went through it and then she revealed that she was selling this like gigantic, massive course for $47. And I was like, what? I would be so suspicious of that. I'd be like, yeah. no, it's not worth my time. Yeah. What is in there? No nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Charge more. Yeah. Hey, I want, I, I want to talk a second about in your book, um, you say the phrase um, tiny penis syndrome in disguise. It sounds like, like someone said this to you at some point. Like, was this, did you make that up or did like a guy say that to you? What is that? No, I mean, I was just, when I was writing chapter titles that came about, but it was a really fun time reading these kinds of things aloud when I was doing the audiobook in front of a bunch of male engineers. <laughs> like, I'm going for it. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, which one is it? Which one is it? <laughs> is it you? <laughs> it, maybe it's you. <laughs> Who's got the tiny penis? <laughs> so funny i just had to look down like don't don't laugh don't, just go just say it just say it okay <laughs> i said all sorts of words in there crotch scapade <laughs> but wait wait go back to the tiny penis in disguise what is what do you mean by that <laughs> <laughs> oh god everyone's putting on a show every day of their lives it's so sucky every single person out there who's trying to be this serious corporate professional and especially the people who are usually telling you that your ideas are bad and you shouldn't pursue them. You should be grateful for what you've got. Absolutely the worst advice anyone could ever take. Um, these are the people who are walking around and, and they're being that way and so sure in their own ideas because they're not sure at all. And they're covering up the fact that they're incredibly insecure. Nobody knows what they're doing. Nobody out there. And it's crazy. When I first got to Philadelphia, I was like, okay, as I, as I talked about, I thought everybody knew what they were doing. I was going to copy them. No, I love, I love this I story. You don't want to copy what? someone who doesn't know what they're doing. Totally. I love this, no, this story no, I, that you have Ash in your book about, um, you drag the, the, the tarp in with the, the home, the shingles and you paint the back of the shingles and start sending them out. But what I really love about that story is the girl, I forget what her name was, that Tiffany, Tiffany, that kept walking by like, oh, <laughs> yeah, what is this art class? Like she, she was curious about your creative idea. <laughs> and you guys will have to read the book, The Middle Finger Project, when it comes out officially to, to hear the whole story. But it was just, the, the point is, I'm assuming that you were doing something creative to stand out from the crowd. And when you do that, People are like, what are you doing? They want to tear you down. And I, I'm experiencing that lately because of some marketing that I'm doing. But it's like, oh, it's good, isn't it? You like it. You're curious. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, that situation broke my heart because she was my friend. And I think so often when you're trying to do something creative and different, just the mere act of doing that is indirectly saying to someone else who's sitting in front of you that I think what you're doing is not good enough because I'm doing it differently. So 
I think oftentimes that's how it gets perceived. And that's why people have this underlying resentment about it because a, you're telling them that you don't really think that they're doing a good enough job and B uh, there's so much of like just them taking that to mean like now I have to, I have to step it up. And that means more work for me now. You're making more work for me because you're making me look bad. <laughs> and maybe that's a good lesson for people. People don't yeah. like that. And they don't like it because, well, you know, and, <laughs> and really, honestly, it doesn't, if you see somebody doing something creative, it doesn't mean that you have to be doing that because it might not be your version of creative. You know, it might not work for for you. But, and that's why we got to stay in our own lane and use our own creativity. Well, and we also go into this place of of this comparison process of comparing ourselves to others when we really don't need to do that. And then you see so many people falling into imposter syndrome. And I know that the your book has a lot to do with that. Um, how do you overcome that? What what advice could you give on overcoming imposter syndrome? You know what? This is just this was something that. I thought a lot about, obviously, actually, I didn't even know my book was really at its core so much about imposter syndrome until I wrote it, because that ended up being the main theme of everything that I do, all the work that I do, all of the stuff that I do. It's about giving women courage to say, God fucking damn it, I got this. So with imposter syndrome, one of the things that I've noticed over the years is so much of that, like 50% of it comes when you are faking the enjoyment. And I mean that because it's like... So many of us are doing the things in life that we, that we think make sense. Like, all right, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start freelancing in this, in accounting, because that's what I know. And that makes sense, for example. But I think just because something makes sense doesn't mean it still won't make you miserable. So what ooh. happens is, right? Like, ooh, ooh. ooh. That is good. People, people do that, what makes sense. And then, because they're, they're not actually doing something they really like, they start to have to fake it every day. They have to fake to their clients. They actually like what they're doing. They have to fake to their boss. They have to fake it every day. The enjoyment part of that. And I think that's where a lot of imposter syndrome comes from. Not because you don't belong there, but because if you're faking it every day, of course you're going to feel like a fraud. Like <laughs> That's just what that feels like, man. Yeah. Were you ever there? Did you ever have that feeling? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Towards the end of my corporate career, I wanted to get hit by a tractor trailer one day because I thought... <laughs> that that would get me out of going to the office. Isn't well, that and sick? also a good indicator is if you if you can't wait to get home and drown your sorrows in three or four glasses of wine, Ooh, that's yeah. a pretty good indicator that you don't like what you're doing. Just saying from experience. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. I talk about the girl who like is buying like the extra large bottle of yellow tail. <laughs> Drinking from the Not bottle. Not that I don't approve of that. But <laughs> been there, been oh. there. You know, carrying these little like vodka bottles around before get, you know doing sales calls back in the day with advertising. Mm. I was a great employee. <laughs> <laughs> One more question before we get into our signature closing questions is um, you talk about quitting and, you know, quitting is some serious counter programming to what we're used to hearing, which is never give up, you know. And so why do you feel like quitting can be helpful in certain situations? <laughs> never give up. Oh, yes. Quitters are never winners or whatever that phrase is. It's terrifying. Yeah, we give ourselves a lot of bad advice. Uh, quitting is a great thing because if you quit a hundred things, that means you're also starting a hundred things and you're giving yourself a chance to figure out what you actually like doing. You're not going to find your passions in your living room. You're just not. So I think quitting is a really good indicator that you're actually trying a lot of new stuff. And I think that we oftentimes guilt ourselves when something doesn't work out But that's backwards because it's like going to a restaurant. I read about this. It's like going to a restaurant and trying the duck nards and surprise, surprise, you don't actually like duck nards. You don't feel bad about that. You're going to another restaurant, like right? And that's what we need to think about. (laughs) I don't like duck nards. I don't like duck nards. And I also don't like tennis. And I also don't like yoga. And I also don't like all those things. That ain't a flaw on me. That is absolutely (laughs) something wrong with that thing (laughs) with me. It doesn't work out. (laughs) So good. Quitting is upgrading. It's a great thing to be doing. (laughs) Oh, I love that. Quitting is upgrading. 
It is. Oh, okay. next, next. I mean, think about it like men. When you quit those guys, you're not guilty Fuck about yeah. that either. You're like, the guy was no good. Next. next. And you can take it from <laughs> too many IDs. You in can your take drawer. it from a lot of the, the, you know, the huge successful big names that you look into. A lot of those guys and ladies would try shit and it would miserably fail to the tune of millions of dollars. And then they'd be like, eh, well, there's one, there's a tax write off and move to the next thing. <laughs> Yeah, I I spent a a shit ton of money in 2019 on a project that is no longer on my radar. And I was like adding it up over the weekend doing my taxes. And I'm like, that's a pretty decent tax write off for something I quit. (laughs) So there's an upside. You know, That's true. And I never thought about it that way. You're right. The tax write off piece is great. Well, and it's the education process. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I just discovered the other day, I didn't really know that if you have a client who gives you bad debt and they don't pay your invoice, you can write that off. I didn't know that. Tax tips from Ash. (laughs) Yes, you can. You can write off bad debt. That when people don't, we got it all. I folks. love it. Yes. Hey, um, we we didn't ask you at the top, and I want to ask you this now as we get ready to wrap up. Um, you know that this show is called "Women Your Mother Warned You About," and you were excited about that. Cool. Um, we assume you consider yourself one of those women, but we want to hear from you your definition of that. What makes you a woman your mother warns you about? Ooh, first of all, I'll make the disclaimer that something weird has been happening where friends of mine who have gotten early copies of the book have been telling me that their mom picked it up and now their mom really likes me. And I'm like, what? <laughs> that, that's not right. <laughs> that's not how this is supposed to your work. Your mother was supposed to warn you about me. Uh, yeah, you know what? I'm not a, I'm not a nice girl. I think that being, being called a nice girl is the biggest insult ever because it's such, it's such a generic adjective. And if you can't come up with something better than nice, then I'm doing something wrong. So I think I'm not a nice girl in a lot of ways. I'm not the girl that you want to take home uh, and settle down with kids. I've written about that a little bit in my book. (laughs) I think there are other things we can be doing that make us come alive. And I don't think it has to be the the default next step. It can be a step, but I don't think it needs to be the very next one. I think there's a lot of rules we're all following that are just totally like bogus programmed things. People are marrying one another because like, you know, it was the next thing we were supposed to do. I'm like, ew, could you have a set of balls? Yeah, I did that twice already. So don't do that. (laughs) 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 Maybe like signing a contract. That's a big deal. Like, this, is, this is a huge thing. So I, I definitely think that, um, you know, a lot of my friends who are nice girls, you know, like they even warn their kids about me now. It's like, <laughs> don't go around that woman. I, we don't want her values. <laughs> depends, on, depends on the mom, though. It depends on the mom. You know, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of moms out there are worried that their kid will learn the long, wrong thing. And I'm all about, hey, I would like for my child to learn learn the wrong thing as quickly as possible because then she can move on to Ooh, better yeah. knowledge. Like, you know, my child, she's she's got a different sort of mommy. <laughs> yes, she does. <laughs> I love that. I love yes. that. I feel like you're like the cool aunt mom. That's kind of what I would be, I think, if I ever had to be one. Yeah. Well, you know, I just try to be honest with her in the ways that, you know, most moms are trying to protect their children from the world. And my idea is to arm my child with the best uh, weapons. I was about to say tools, let's call them instead of weapons tools, <laughs> and how to deal with the world. But that's me. And I'm not a mom. I'm a crazy. I'm the crazy aunt. I'm the crazy uh, aunt where you're like, please, let's not keep her with Gina for that long. <laughs> <laughs> Gina's a great dog, mom. I'm trying to keep a plant alive. I'm trying very hard. Oh, God. I can forget that. I won't even try. I've tried. I kill them. Let's talk about sexy. Ooh. All right. Let's talk about (laughs) How do you define sexy? Truth. I'm really turned on by truth and wit. Oh, my God. If you're witty, mm, if you can banter with me, that's sexy. And that's why I love creative writers because it's just a form of uh, intellectual banter on a page. It's great. Right. How do you define sexy? 
uh, you know, we've had so many definitions of sexy, which has been so cool because we ask this question every time and it's all over the place. For me, sexy is about confidence and being comfortable in your skin and not giving a fuck what anybody thinks. Oh, that's so good. When you, you can tell, it's like the BDE, the big dick energy people. <laughs> Have you heard that? Yes, phrase? I it's have. great. I have. <laughs> it's we were talking about how Matthew McConaughey has massive he BD. He sure does. <laughs> he's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even care if it's big or not, but you know, oh he's got god. the energy. Oh my god. I like that this keeps coming full circle, like we're on the size of penis. <laughs> keeps coming back to the penis. Ever that, since I, I was a small being... child, I it always did. And I used to be get in trouble. I got there's a lot of stories from me being young and and going there, like having questions about it. And now as an adult, I still go there. So clearly, it's part of me. <laughs> <laughs> so Ash, what's the best advice you've ever been given? Travel number one. No, I'm taking it back. That's the best advice I would give. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that was the next question. That would be another question. <laughs> I'm taking it back. That, yeah, that would be my best advice to give anyone. I mean, I think it's just so useful as a tool for anything you want to do. I don't care what it is, if it's business, if it's personal development, if it's not thinking you're such a schlub, whatever it is, travel. But the best advice I've been given is absolutely go, go, go by Seth Godin. I think those three little words have made a huge difference in my life. Every time I look at them, I thought about getting them tattooed on me, which I've never even done before. Like that's, that's a thing. Um, but every time I see them, I remind myself to stop trying to make it perfect and stop trying to have everything right because everything's an iteration anyway, no matter what, even if you think you have it right today, tomorrow, you're going to be changing it anyway. So go, go, go. I love that. Are you friends with Seth? I mean, I wouldn't call us friends, but we've exchanged multiple emails and he endorsed my book. <laughs> That's awesome. So I was really excited for that. that awesome. he's, a, he's really a mentor for me. I love that him. Is, well, I was going to say, you know, if you guys are besties, you know, you could you could suggest he needs to hang out with the women your mother warned you about, too. Oh, can you imagine what this conversation would be like with Seth and the other? Oh, my God. <laughs> Big dick energy, Seth. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> I love me some Seth. Hey, we like, I have a big bald head. (laughs) Bald is sexy. Uh, It has been so great having you on the show today. For me, it's been, of course, my personal girl business crush um, to have you here. Now I feel like we can be friends. Yay. We can be friends. Um, I feel like this is the best part about publishing a book is getting to bullshit with cool people every day, all day. And calling that work. Like, this is my job now. Doing it. Promoting the book. And you do it well. And we're going to promote the shit out of your book. Uh, But in the meantime, if people want to go directly to find your book, where is the best place for them to do that? TheMiddleFingerProject.org. Not only is the book there, but we're doing these fun things right now where we have, like, we've always had the 25 Days to 100K Challenge, which is great. But now we're putting up this hysterical Quit Your Job store, which is going to be free to access all these different funny things in there. So wherever you're at with that, there's going to be a fun quiz. Like, should you quit your fucking job or not? (laughs) It's going to be great. So pop over there. All the things are over there. And we didn't even get a chance to talk too much about Middle Finger Project. So maybe we can have you back. Maybe you would come back and hang out with us. Yeah, I would love to. I would love to hang out with you guys in person. I feel like we'd get arrested. (gasps) Where do you live? Where are you? (laughs) Philly, Philly, that's right. Philly. I can come to Philly. I've got a bestie that lives there. We can there. come to Philly. Spirit, spirit flies there. Where are you guys both? Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. My bestie, bestie lives oh, in Philly. Wow. No shit. Well, holler at me. I just bought a place here, so I'm it's like kind of here. It's a door. It's fun. Can we stay there? I mean, there, there needs. Yeah, you can stay here. There needs to be some stuff. Like we're doing some interior yeah. design stuff. The guys are coming to paint the ceiling. I pulled out old track lighting. Your, your, I mean, your statue it's fun. needs a, a, a flower necklace. Oh my god! She totally does. I'll get you one. She totally does. Her name is okay. Her name is Judy. I don't know. They named her Judy, but I feel like we could do better. Judy needs a better name. Mm, Yeah, we could have we could have a contest for you. Um, (laughs) Name name the statue. I love you guys. Thank you so much. You. let me know what I can do. I'm going to share all of this. This is getting shared all over the internet. Share this all over the interwebs. And uh, so thanks again to Ash for being on our show today and to all of our Warners for listening to this episode of Women Your Mother Warned You About. 
To learn more about us, visit our website at womenyourmotherwarnsyouabout.com. You can also connect with me, Gina Tremarco, directly at ginatremarco.com. To learn more about Pivot 10 Results, Carolina Improv, or to book me as a speaker or trainer. And to connect with me, Rachel Pitts, you can find me all over social media as The Singing Lender and find me at thesinginglender.com. You can find all of our social media links, including links to Keith Walters, our fabulous male counterpart, on our website, as well as some cool free downloads. So check them all out at womenyourmotherwarnsyouabout.com. Awesome. A couple other things to know, Warners. If you have not already given us a rating and review, you can go to iTunes to do that or any other place that you listen to podcasts, just in case we didn't mention it. And hey, more importantly, if you love our show, show the love and share it with a friend, colleague, client, anybody, someone you meet on the bus or on a train or in the street when you're on vacation in Paris, in London. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> goofy <laughs> just one way to give value with a free resource to others and strengthen those business relationships without expecting anything in return and don't forget derma vogue keeping us prettier than we already are check them out at dermavogue.com and warners keep on keeping it sexy just like rachel and i and keith too And remember, for the best relationships, keep it real, raw, and relevant. And a little irreverence doesn't hurt either. Bye, Bye, Warners. Bye, Ranger. Bye, Gina. This really will get serious soon. Yeah. Don't, it doesn't have to. I don't think anybody wants it to be serious.